welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell. Welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. If this is your first time listening, a very warm welcome. Now, in this episode, we're joined by economist and entrepreneur Ricardo Amarim. Now, Ricardo is founder and CEO of Recam Consultoria, a financial and investment consultancy, as well as recent startups AAA Academy and Smart Trips. Ricardo is also the author of the best selling book, After the Storm. He's a host on Brazil's leading news channel, Globo News as well as being a business school lecturer and a keynote speaker. Now, the focus of our conversation is Brazil, which regular listeners will know is a place very close to my heart, and about the economy of which Ricardo is a globally renowned expert. We cover the role that culture and history have played in the economic challenges that Brazil has recently faced. And in fact, Ricardo is very clear to refer to these challenges as a depression and not simply as a recession. And he points out that the contraction in the um, Brazilian economy over the last three years is nearly twice that felt in the US in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Now, Ricardo talks authoritatively and frankly about some of these challenges and the challenges of doing business in Brazil generally, saying that while they didn't invent either football or red tape, they have improved both of them. And we talk about the enormous opportunity that exists in what is already the world's eighth largest economy, including the room for economic growth that will follow as the current very low levels of consumer credit start to expand. And finally, we touch on the innovation landscape of Brazil and how it compares and contrasts to both its South American neighbours and elsewhere around the world. So without further ado, here is Ricardo Amarim. So Ricardo, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to be here with you, Mark. So let's start by talking about a topic which I know is dear to your heart. I mean, what are some of the challenges of doing business in Brazil? Oh, there are plenty of. Uh, One of the things that I usually uh, tell my my clients and uh, companies willing to do business in Brazil is that Brazil is not for beginners. And what I mean by that is that, yes, plenty of the challenges that you find elsewhere you also find in Brazil, but there are some specific challenges or some challenges that are bigger in Brazil. The first one is infrastructure. Let's get transportation, for instance. Based on a ranking by the World Bank, among 148 countries, Brazil is ranked. It's not among the 100 best countries in infrastructure, neither in roads, railways, ports, air transportation. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is uh, red tape. I, I tease my Brazilian friends. Uh, quite often saying that uh, Brazil has not invented neither soccer nor red tape, but we have improved both, in particular red tape. Our ability to make things that could be easy, hard, is unparalleled. And uh, that means that companies need to have a lot of patience and need to know that uh, sometimes things that are elsewhere would take much less time to get done. Here, probably they, they will take longer. I think there are plenty of other important challenges, but a point that I want to make is exactly because doing business in Brazil is harder than in in most other large markets, what that creates is a huge opportunity for those willing to tackle those challenges. Because what happens is that in the end, many companies give up. And because of that, for the most part, competition in most markets in Brazil is not as big as elsewhere. And exactly because of that, profit margins tend to be higher here than elsewhere. So what I usually say is that, uh, yes, it's very hard to do business in Brazil, but that's exactly why in the long run and with uh, a lot of oscillation and in the meantime, average profit margins in Brazil tend to be better than in most other markets, in particular in other markets that are as large as Brazil is. Interesting. You know, it's worth calling out. I mean, it's the eighth largest economy in the world at the moment, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. And uh, very likely it will be larger than that in, in the future. It was larger than that, but in the last three years, Brazil went through the hardest economic depression, not, not recession, in its history. Just to give you an idea, in three years, Brazilian economy actually contracted by seven percentage points. To Again, to give a, a, a long-term perspective, if uh, we're talking to U.S. listeners, for instance, the Great Depression in the U.S. was not as bad as uh, what Brazil has gone through in the last three years. So what we have here is the economy, uh, if, and I think this will happen, uh, Brazil actually resumes growing, which has already resumed last year. I think that the economy will accelerate this year and very likely next year again. We will likely have Brazil among the top six or, or maybe top five in three to five years. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what's your sense? I mean, if this drag on the economy, the challenges of doing business, the the, the poor infrastructure, the red tape, I mean, if those are resolved over time, I mean, what, what's possible for Brazil? W- would, would profit margins expand or do you think that the, it would attract more competition and those would be competed away? I think very likely if that happened, yes, it would attract a, a lot of more competition, but on, on the other hand, we would have much more growth. So if we compare Brazil to other emerging markets over the last decades, what we've had is, despite the fact that the market is very large, it has not grown as much as other emerging markets, which has been compensated from a company perspective by the fact that, again, in average, profit margins tend to be higher. And I say in average because the other important challenges, as I said, is that volatility, economic volatility here tends to be higher than elsewhere, which the last years made very clear. So uh, let's say that in 10 or 20 years, your average profit margin is here. Here is, is let's say, uh, I'm going to exaggerate. Let's say it's twice as large as in other markets. But you have three years, which depending on the market where you are, you you, you might need to go through losses and in some cases, some severe losses, particularly in very cyclical sectors such as auto and real estate, maybe your company is not willing to take this kind of a a huge oscillation in uh, results, in earnings, even if in the long term, you're going to make more money here than elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because at Syngenta, as I mentioned earlier on, I mean, you know, it's a huge company in Brazil. And I remember that we developed a, a barter program to deal with this volatility. And that became a huge source of competitive advantage, which other agribusinesses followed. But what's driving this volatility? Is, is it the exposure of the economy to commodities or is it more you know, growing pains? I mean, what's unique about Brazil in this context? First thing, as you said, it is uh, the exposure to commodities. It's important to keep in mind that uh, Brazil is currently the second largest global uh, agribusiness exporter just uh, after the U.S. And in some important markets, such as soybeans, Brazil is already larger than the U.S. Going forward, very likely, Brazil's market share is going to increase. And the reason is that if we take into account available land for farming, which as of now is not planted as of yet, 40% of uh, available area for farming that is not planted as of yet in the world is in Brazil. So not only uh, there is a huge technological advance in in, in agribusiness going on in Brazil, but on top of it, so uh, what that means is that productivity is increasing a lot. It has increased a lot in the last two to three decades. But on top of it, there is a lot of availability of land and also uh, water. So uh, having in mind those two factors, it's almost impossible not to forecast Brazil's market share in the agribusiness uh, market to go further up. So uh, with that in mind, the point that I want to make is, yes, Brazil is already an important market in in, in agribusiness. It will become more. But that doesn't solve the fact that uh, agribusiness prices go up and down a lot. And actually, they are going up and and down even more than in, in previous decades because of the first the increased importance of uh, China and India as consumers. But second, the fact that financial oscillations have also increased in in the 2008 crisis, uh, the real estate uh, crisis in the U.S. and the global financial crisis is an example. To be frank, I think that we might be relatively close to another one in the coming years. But, uh, But in any case, so that's point number one. The point number two is that Brazil is quite an open economy to financial flows which ch- change direction very fast when the economy is, the, the global economy gets better or worse and Brazil economy gets better or worse. But on the other hand, it's a relatively closed economy from a trade perspective. 
Trading flow in Brazil, the sum of exports and imports, only account to slightly more than 20% of uh, GDP, which even taking into account that Brazil is a large economy, and usually large economies have much lower share of trade flows as compared to, to smaller economies, but if compared to large economies, it's, it's very small. It's less than half of, uh, of uh, the figure in China. It's uh, smaller than in the U.S. And I'm talking about economies which are much larger than Brazil. So that's one of the things, because trade flows tend to be less volatile than financial flows. And uh, so that's one another point that brings volatility. And the last one, which has been very important in the last years, it wasn't as important in the past, is that Brazil has gone through a huge a political crisis due to probably the largest corruption scandals on Earth's history. So uh, this brought even more volatility and, and, and uncertainty. Uh, those things are getting fixed, but particularly the political one takes a long while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you travel a lot. You've worked in the US and you've worked in Europe, Ricardo. I'm, I'm curious, I mean, what are some of the common myths and misunderstandings that that, that I'd say Westerners, people in Europe or people in North America have about doing business in, in your country? Not Notwithstanding the, we've talked a little bit about the red tape, but what are some of the other misunderstandings? I think that one particular misunderstanding is how complicated our tax system is. What I mean by that is that, yes, companies expect taxes in Brazil to be confused, to say the least, but it's much worse than what people expect. To be more specific, again, based on uh, some uh, World Bank research, for the most part, companies in the world tend to take less than, in average, less than 200 hours to field taxes elsewhere. There are two countries which are big exceptions to that. The first one is Venezuela, where the average time spent uh, by companies on filling taxes is 800 hours. And then you have Brazil, where it's almost 2,000 hours. So, yes, companies expect our tax system to be complicated, but they don't have a clue how complicated it is. I would say that's probably the biggest misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I mean, let's get into some of the companies that are active in the economy, which maybe haven't really um, cropped up on the global radars of, of some of our listeners. But which are the companies or leaders that you see as being truly groundbreaking and innovative in some of the Brazilian markets that you're aware of? I would tackle that from two perspectives. The first one is the startups. Brazil has gone through a huge increase in innovation coming both from established companies and startups. From a startup point of view, just this year, we had three uh, Brazilian companies becoming unicorns. It started with uh, 99, which is a company that competes with Uber. And by the way, there is another a finan- a fintech called Nubank. And we are seeing that in, in, in several different sectors. In healthcare, there are plenty of companies. They ha- uh, Since they haven't uh, recently gone through any kind of major financing rounds, we don't, we don't really have current valuations on that. But there are at least a handful of them which will become uh, unicorns. The reason I'm saying that is that uh, it's kind of a weird thing. But uh, until uh, last year, there was no uh, Brazilian unicorn, which is kind of a uh, particular weird if we compare with uh, countries which much smaller markets, particularly uh, there were a, a handful of Argentine companies. And the fact is that, again, because doing business in Brazil is, is harder, it took a little bit longer for that to come true. But on the other hand, because the market is much bigger right now, there are plenty of companies which have reached this, uh, this level. And then on top of it, when we talk about uh, established companies, I think that the most interesting thing is that since this big economic crisis that Brazil has gone through in the last year, I would say that the word innovation has become a key for any company of any size. It, it, it's almost impossible to talk to uh, any important Brazilian business leader and uh, to have a talk and, and not to come through the topic of uh, innovation. So you have companies such as, and you have companies that have, have always focused on that, particularly the 3G group in its own sector and, and, and business model has gone through uh, important innovative uh, practice. We have uh, Gerdau, which is a steel company, which also has always invested a lot in innovation and, and, and several other local companies. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned 3G because, I mean, this was the 
one of the companies that I'm aware of, and a lot of our listeners, because of some of our previous guests, you know, who are connected with Berkshire Hathaway, will be aware of of 3G. But I mean, you know, the backstory here, and and add, feel free to add to this. You know, it's founded by three guys who basically created an investment bank very similar to Goldman Sachs. I think they modelled it on Goldman Sachs, which is I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong. It's Garantia. Is that how I pronounce it? That's absolutely right. And then what they did, I think, was they copied Walmart to create Lojos Americas. Then they copied a number of Latin American beer companies to produce to, when they when they bought Brahma Beer Company. And then there was recently they bought Anheuser-Busch and Burger King and Heinz. And, and people here in Switzerland, I should say, Ricardo, are, are you know, we're feeling the ripples of that acquisition alongside Berkshire Hathaway when they bought Heinz, uh, bought Kraft and acquired and merged with Heinz, because obviously there's a knock-on effect in the whole food industry and there's some big food players here. So, you know, I'm curious because if you read the bio of these three guys behind 3G, they're very explicit around how they went to the best in the world and just copied and duplicated and, ex- and out-executed. Is that what innovation means? means when you hear CEOs talk about it in Brazil or are there different definitions there? No, I think there are different definitions, but I think they're absolutely right that one of the things that uh, three partners of 3G has always emphasized is that it's always easier to copy what works and adapt than to create something new. One of the reasons why technology has not been his piece of case is exactly because that uh, has been for the last decades the sector where innovation has been most present. And exactly because of that, the modes that companies create tend to be more at risk. So in a sense, the fact that there is less innovation in one particular sector, it means that that company and that sector if the company is able to create some moat, is more shielded than in other sectors where innovation is, is, is much larger. But in that sense, uh, I think that there is something which is key and very specific to the 3G group since its beginning, since Garantia, which you're absolutely right, it, it was Goldman Sachs. But the whole idea was, let's bring the best people, ideally, as young as possible, and ideally, people who are willing to make what would be, let let me call it a a Brazilian dream as an American dream, someone who might come from an economic background, which is as not favored as others might, but who is really willing to work a lot to do his best and who's bright enough uh, to make things work. And and that's a business model that they have kept basically in in all the business that they they, they have done. On top of it, one of the things that they, they do a lot is exactly to develop this kind of talent because what they say is that the big bottleneck for their expansion on a global uh, scale as of now is exactly to have people which are prepared and able to take and tackle larger challenges. And uh, in that sense, and when I say prepared, they don't want people to be ready. One of the things that they also emphasize a lot is that they want someone who is not ready, but who is smart enough to become ready in, in the way and who is willing to do the hard work which is necessary for that to happen. So their model is around talent, essentially. I mean, motivate finding talent who are hungry, who can stretch way beyond what they think they're capable of or have the appetite for doing that, and, and then giving them the opportunities to go and do that in these large companies that they acquire. Absolutely. And to pay them accordingly. So the whole idea is that you have people who are able to make it have the prospects of making big money. And that's where the incentive part comes from. And, and some of the critics say that they tend to be quite aggressive on that, both in terms of paying very well those who make it happen. And on the other hand, of uh, letting go those uh, who don't have the performance that was expected to for them to have. Yeah, and that's why them teaming up with Berkshire Hathaway was so fascinating, because in many respects, their model of, you know, what happens to an acquired company is completely the opposite of what Berkshire Hathaway does, right? I mean, they put zero cost accounting in, zero based accounting, and and it's a bloodbath for many of the acquired companies. You are absolutely right. But on the other hand, what I think that they have in common is long term deal. That's also something that Buffett has always emphasized, how important it is to have a, a long term perspective, how a uh, big competitive advantage that has been for his companies. And that's something that uh, the 3G team also has. And I think there is another important and very telling story of how they look to business, which is how they decided to move into the beer business. Basically, they were looking at a, a list of uh, the richest men in the world, and particularly in Latin America, and they started to see many of them coming from the beverage business and the food industry. And the reason, again, is exactly because those industries 
tend to change much less rapidly than some others. And they said, oh, there's probably an opportunity because uh, the other thing that that creates is exactly because it doesn't change as fast. Companies, uh, for the most part, tend not to be as agile. And they said, oh, given that uh, we have been breeded on a culture exactly of a lot of agility, which is what investment banks are, are, are good at, there is probably an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we talked about 3G. You also mentioned a steel company and these unicorns. I mean, are there any other businesses or companies that you're aware of that really have the opportunity to leapfrog the competitors in other markets? Is Brazil going to be exporting some big businesses that are going to dominate outside the region? I would love that to be true. One of the things that I see happening, which is quite sad from a Brazilian perspective, is the companies that are willing and are trying to do that in a sense, become much less Brazilian. What I mean by that is that the, the 3G groups is a good example. Because of some of the challenges of doing business in Brazil, what we have now is that their headquarters is not based in Brazil at this point. And again, I mentioned other companies that have an important presence elsewhere. I mentioned Gerdau before. They are big in the US. But the fact is that we have much less Brazilian companies moving abroad than elsewhere. And again, to be frank, I think it's, there, there is a, a business and a cultural reason for that. And the thing is, and, and, and again, I think that explains a lot when I was talking about unicorns, why we had a couple of Argentine unicorns before Brazilian unicorns. Because when a startup is born in Argentina, it already thinks in terms of a global market because the Argentine market is not big enough. In Brazil, for the most part, the companies for quite a while start looking at the Brazilian market alone because they say, oh, it's good enough for a certain number of, of years. And then later on, you start to think globally. And because there are lots of specificities in, in doing business in Brazil, some of the things that make them strong in Brazil might not be necessary or a competitive advantage elsewhere. And that limits the number of Brazilian companies that make it on, on, on a global scale. On the other hand, exactly those specificities make them stronger as compared to foreign competition in Brazilian markets in many cases. So I'm curious, as you see foreign companies coming into Brazil, I mean, how do the incumbents tend to react? I'm interested, for instance, if is there a sort of a not invented here syndrome that, that plays out in Brazil? Does everything have to be homegrown or are they very willing to take on board ideas that are brought in from outside? No, they are very willing to, to take ideas brought from the outside. And in some cases, I would say that there is something which is quite Brazilian specific and, and quite sad, which is kind of a, I would call it an inverted prejudice. What I mean is that in many senses, things that come from abroad are more valued in Brazil than the ones that uh, actually were born here in Brazil. There is a certain sense, we, we even have a name for that here in Brazil, which is, we call that a kind of a the poor dog syndrome. The way the Brazilians look at, at, at what comes from Brazil tend to be more negative than the way that they look from ideas and products and, and services that come from abroad. Interesting. But I mean, you do have, I mean, because of the enormous growth of the middle class over the last 10 or 20 years, I mean, there are some, some remarkably, as you say, profitable and well-run domestic companies, of course, aren't there? Absolutely. And, and, and let me give some perspective on that. Between 2004 and 2014, we had more than 50 million Brazilians moving to the middle class or upper classes. What that means is that there was a huge increase in consumption in Brazil. And But the interesting thing is that because of the huge economic crisis of the last years, uh, almost 20 million of those moved back to the lower classes. What happens is, as the economy is speeding up, I did some research on that, and in, in the next 10 years, at least 30 to 35 million people uh, will move to the, to the middle classes and, and, and upward. And what that means is that, again, all the, the business related to consumption are likely to do very well in Brazil. And actually, for the last 15 years, every single year, with very few exceptions, we had everything related to retail consumption and to services doing better than the economy in general, particularly Healthcare and education have done extremely well. All, all the subsectors in those two industries have done very well, exactly because people moving up to the middle class start to pay more attention to what I call tomorrow. Because when they are in the lower classes, unfortunately, the only thing they really can take care of is today. 
And then particularly healthcare and education tend to do very well. Yeah. Yeah. I heard these stories that, you know, as soon as people get a job, the first thing they do is they spend money on their teeth, on just sort of, as you say, preparing themselves for tomorrow. Then they get the credit card, then they get the, the mortgage, the car loan. And people, commentators have talked about it feeling like where America was in the late 60s, early 70s, that sort of pent up demand as the, as the middle class expands very, very quickly. Yeah, I think it's a very good comparison. And there is one more point which you, you mentioned, which I think it's good to keep in mind, which is credit expansion is something very new from a Brazil perspective. It, it's something that has only started happening in the last 10 years or so. And the reason is that interest rates in Brazil were absurdly high. And actually, from a foreign perspective, they still are. But from a Brazilian perspective, they, they are the lowest ever. To give you an idea, absurdly high. It, it, it's good to keep in mind that until 1993, Brazil used to have hyperinflation. And that had a, a big uh, consequences. One of them was there was no credit available. The second one, which I'll, I'll come back later, is Brazilian company is start to have very short-term planning horizons. But coming back to the credit perspective, what, what, what happens with that is that there was no credit. And since 1994, interest rates have started falling. But basic rates in Brazil in 1994 were 45% per annum. Now, which is the lowest ever in Brazilian history, they are still at six and a half, which as of now, from a, a global perspective, is extremely high. And when we get to credit to the consumer, because there are, again, other, uh, there, are, there is a lot of tax in credit in Brazil, banking reserves in Brazil are at the level of banking reserves exactly because hyperinflation and financial prices that Brazil had in the past are extremely high. And because of that, what we have is that the lending rates in Brazil are humongously high. We have uh, credit card rates at three digit levels. So what that means is as rates are going down, there is a lot of room to a lot of expansion also in terms of credit availability. And, and what that means is, again, an, an important boost to growth going forward. The level of a consumer indebtedness in Brazil, in absolute terms, is 1 25th of what it is in the, in the U.S. Even if we take into account that uh, per capita income in the U.S. is five times higher than in Brazil, on a relative terms adjusted to income, credit debt, consumer debt in Brazil is one fifth of uh, what it is in the U.S. But just getting back to the other point in terms of planning, because I think it's interesting and important, because of all this economic volatility, political change, uh, changes in regulations, I would say that Brazilians are out of the curve and probably unparalleled in terms of their ability to adapt to changing environments. So Brazilian companies tend to be much more agile and able to, to deal with, as I mentioned, to a recession as big as the one that Brazil had last year. On the other hand, the negative part of it is that Brazilians are not good at all in terms of uh, long-term planning. And the reason is that they are not used to think long-term because they say, I don't have a clue what is going to happen in the long term. Let me try to look to the next six months where I have some more visibility. I, I, I have a better idea of what might happen. And that means that in companies and sectors where long-term planning is key, I would say that foreigners, which are much more used to do this kind of planning, tend, tend to have an advantage. On the other hand, if you need to adapt very quickly, Brazilians tend to do well. And I think that's a, another reason why Brazilian agribusiness is so, is, is so strong. Because in agribusiness, as you know well, the ability and the need to adapt quickly to changing environments is key. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm glad you touched on some of that. I mean, so maybe we can just talk about a couple of leadership behaviors and, and I'd just be interested where you think, you know, how you'd characterize communicating in Brazil. And let me just give you a frame here, Ricardo. I mean, one extreme, a very low context environment, you know, let's say the US or, or Holland, for instance, and the other extreme, a very high context environment, Japan and China, where you need to read between the lines. Where would you put the Brazilian way of communicating on that scale? I would say it's closer to Japan than to to U.S. One of the things that I say to my Brazilian friends and particularly to foreigners that are coming to Brazil, which are not used to the Brazilian culture, is that quite often when Brazilians say yes, what they actually mean is maybe. When they say maybe, they mean no. Brazilians uh, tend to have a, a difficulty of saying no, which uh, Americans don't have at all. Uh, and which, by the way, the Japanese cannot do at all. So uh, I would say it's closer to, it's not as extreme as it is in Japan, but it is uh, closer to Japan than Brazil. On the other hand, Japanese culture tends to be very formal. 
And uh, in Brazil, it's exactly the opposite. In that sense, it's much closer to US than it would be to Japan. Yeah, yeah. You're touching on the next one, which is leadership. I mean, egalitarian versus hierarchical. What's the leadership model that you see in most prevalent in large Brazilian organizations? If we compare again to the US, which is the one that I know the best, uh, having worked there for, for nearly 10 years, I would say that for the most part, Brazilian companies tend to be more hierarchical than in the US. But in the recent years, and I think that's a global trend, it has become less and less hierarchical as compared to what uh, it used to be. So companies are trying to adapt and in order to become more innovative, one of the things they are trying to do is actually to, to make hierarchy less important than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Super. And then a couple more of these, because I think this is really helpful. What about disagreements? I mean, Israel, France, very confrontational. Japan, Thailand, avoiding confrontation at all costs. Again, where do you see Brazil and how's that evolving? In that case, I would say we are probably close to the Asian countries you mentioned, then certainly to Israel. And again, it has to do with uh, confrontation requires the ability to say no, which is something that Brazilians don't do very well. So Brazilians tend to avoid confrontation for the most part. I don't think it is as extreme as, as Thailand, for instance, but much closer to that than, than to Israel's culture, but even to, to, to France's. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, deciding, which is really important as well, right? I mean, just interested in you know the consensual, I mean, I, I, I get the sense it's more consensual versus top down. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, it's even more fair to say, if you're talking to younger people, then it's even uh, bigger the trend to be consensus-oriented. And I would say that it is also trending to become more consensus-oriented uh, rather than top-down as a trend in the country as a whole. Yeah, yeah. And just, I mean, I'm going to get to the three questions I sent you to wrap this up, because I know time's tight regarding But one thing that's interesting for me is you talk about this growth of entrepreneurs. I mean, how is failure looked upon in, in Brazil? Is it a badge of honor or is it a, uh, a permanent sort of tattoo that you can't reveal in public and it's a big setback? I mean, how do people look at failure? For most of Brazilian history, it was certainly a permanent tattoo of uh, inability. And uh, it, it has been changing, and, and I would say it has been changing fast. And to a large extent, because of this increased culture of fostering new business and startups, so this is moving towards a culture. And in certain industries, it is already, certainly in the startup industry, as mostly elsewhere, there is no prejudice, I would say at all, in this particular industry. In other ones, it is moving towards, even in terms of changes in legislation that used to penalize much more companies and owners of companies that go worse. So uh, I, I would say that that's, that's a camp where th there is a big cultural shift going on in, in favor of uh, making failure something positive rather than negative, making attempting something important. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've got a couple of startups, one of which I guess is is specifically designed to sort of foster and, and, and help entrepreneurs in innovation, right? I mean, maybe you can just say a little bit about your startups. Yeah, that's true. Actually, last year with uh, some partners in both cases, I started uh, two startups, one of them, which is called Triple Way, which is uh, AAA.academy. The goal of it was exactly to help foster innovation and to keep people and companies aware of uh, what is going on in terms of innovation on a global basis. It's uh, kind of uh, the same kind of uh, message that you bring with your podcast. The only key point that we, we try to keep in mind is that for the most part, people in particular uh, under uh, the economic environment that we had last year that was extremely tough for business here in Brazil, most people and companies were focused on actually remaining alive. And uh, what that means in, in practice is that all or almost all their time was focused on short term and doing their best so that earnings would be enough that companies could survive. And with that in mind, the time and energy and focus that they have in long term and innovation was much lower than what I believe it needs to be as of now when many technologies that have the potential to uh, change the way that we live and do business are, are, are coming to the point of becoming life-changing at the same time. Because one, one thing that I think that most people misunderstand or don't place the necessary attention to and it's, it's the cycle of innovation is that when innovative technology comes for many years, despite the fact that it is a big innovation, the impact that they have both in business and in, in the way that people live tend to be much smaller because they haven't yet reached a point where adoption is so big that it makes a big change. And then eventually 
it comes to that point. And if, if I look now, I see many of those technologies getting to that point. That's the case for blockchain, for artificial intelligence, for wearables in general, for self-driving cars and many others. And uh, 3D printing, maybe a little bit later than some of the other ones that I mentioned. But my point is, I don't think that any company that's going to be around for a long term is going to be doing business in the same way in five years as it is of now. And I don't think that the companies are paying the necessary attention to that. So the way that we tried to tackle this problem was to offer the most important things that are going on so that people could know and based on that, innovate. Let's say they get to know something interesting that a company is doing in Denmark and say, oh, why not doing something similar here in Brazil or something that is happening in a different industry that they could bring to their one. But you send very little time to get to know that and then eventually say, okay, now we need to go deeper in that. So what we try to do really is in a moment where the problem is not to have access to information, but to sort in this huge availability of information, what really matters and what is noise, that's what, what we're trying to do. So what we're trying to do is to give that in five to 10 minutes, the most important thing that is going on so that maybe that is important to them in a sense that they need to act on that. And the other one, which is smart trips, it's targeted at changing the culture of companies in a way that we have people working at, a, at companies adopting an owner's mentality. And what I mean by that is that uh, for the most part, that's true not only in Brazil, but that's particularly true in Brazil, but, but that's true everywhere. Most uh, employees see companies' money as free money. So if they have the availability to spend companies' money, they say, if I spend or if I don't, that doesn't really matter. And we want to change that. And the way that we are doing that, at least that we're beginning to do that, is focusing on uh, corporate travel where companies have their policies and for the most part, employees spend on, on, on the limit of the policy. And what we're trying to do is to create an incentive and to change the culture. The way that we're doing that is, let's say that based on your company policy, you can come to Brazil in, let's say, business class and stay in a five-star hotel. And we say, okay, good. But what if you make a different choice? Oh, you've lived in Brazil, you have friends in Brazil. So if you stayed at a friend's house instead of a hotel, why would you do that? Uh, you, you you might think at first to say, oh, I, I, I want you as comfortable in a friend's house. You say, okay, but then let's do the following. If it's an option, you're not forced to, but if you opt to make decisions that save money, half of the savings are going to go to the company, half of them are going to go to the employee in an employee benefit program that they can change for whatever they want. So for instance, I saw that very recently for a trip to the U.S., in business class, the cost was, let's say, $6,000, and uh, the one in coach was $1,000. If the employee says, okay, you know what, I don't really care in the case to, to fly coach because I'm going to get there in a Saturday, I can sleep, I'm going to be okay, or something like that. Okay, all right. And then this $5,000 that were saved, half of it, the employee will, will benefit in this benefits program. In practice, what this company is very recently, it, it was launched, it, it's less than a year old. But we have already been, there is over 200 companies, and we're not doing any marketing at all until now, but there is over 200 companies that have uh, searched us to, to start to implement some, some uh, of our programs with them, and it's doing very well. Lovely, lovely. So, Ricardo, I mean, you're, you're a busy guy. You get to see all sorts of different businesses and sort of research lots of different trends. I'm curious, what have you changed your mind about recently? Probably the most fair way to answer that is what I haven't changed my mind recently. I keep changing my mind all the time and uh, I'm extremely curious. According to my wife, I probably spend uh, 26 hours a day uh, reading and listening to stuff. And and what that makes is uh, as, a, as I learn new information, I change my mind all the time. I would say one of the interesting things that I changed my mind is that a couple of years ago, first of all, some background, when I used to work in, in Wall Street, I was in charge of emerging markets in some of the banks that I used to work in. And I had been looking at emerging markets for, for a long time. And I saw how important global conditions are to how well countries do, particular countries do. And that's particularly true in emerging markets. It's true in developed markets as well. And I have understood that quite well. But I, I came to a point to believe that it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. When the global economy is doing well, emerging markets are going to do well. And when it's not, they are going to do poorly. And it is true for emerging markets in general, but it's not true to each particular country. That's a lesson that Brazil taught me quite well in the last years. 
because despite the fact that global conditions were doing very well, Brazil went through the worst economic recession ever. And what that means is that uh, local policies have always known that in the long term, they are what determine the, the success or the failure of a country. But even in, in, in short term, in a couple of years, sometimes if countries do things wrong enough, they can do quite poorly, even if external conditions are supportive. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Now, where do you go to get your fresh perspectives to help you solve problems and make decisions, Ricardo? I usually go for two things, a walk and uh, some place in nature. When I lived in, in New York City, I used to live very close to the Central Park, which is where I used to, to, to go walking when I need to take an important decision. Here in Sao Paulo, I live close to Opera, where I do exactly the same thing. And if I have some more time, I actually go to the beach to take a walk. All the most important decisions that I, I've taken in my life were taken under some kind of walk close to nature. Lovely, lovely. Excellent. And final question. I mean, what's your most significant failure or low and what have you learned from that? Oh, there are so many, which is, is it's hard to pick one. But uh, one of them, ju- just to get the point that I mentioned in, in terms of changing my mind, one of the things that I talked a lot in uh, certain years, a while ago, a couple of years ago in Brazil, was that given how supportive external conditions were to Brazil, Brazil was kind of uh, destined to grow for much longer than it actually did. In the meantime, I actually realized that things were getting worse and that it, it would change and it changed for the worse and much worse before they did. But the fact is that before I realized that for a while, I was expecting a positive cycle in Brazil to be much stronger and longer than it actually turned to be. And what I learned to that is that long-term forecasting is, ex- is much harder than it seems at first. We tend to uh, get the short term and and forecast that for much longer than it usually continues to be as it used to. So in in the end, since then, I have studied a lot uh, cycles. Actually, I've studied all economic cycles in 180 countries since 1900. And uh, what I've learned is that, yes, you, you can understand trends, but if you don't understand cycles as well as you understand trends, when those cycles, even if short-term cycles change, you're going to be in trouble. Yep, yep, yep. Where can people get in touch with you? Oh, they can find me in all big uh, social social media. I'm in LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm at Hikan Consult, which is spelled Z-R-I-C-A-M-C-O-N-S-U-L-T. Facebook and elsewhere. And also, if they want more information on me, my company's website is ricanconsultoria.com.br and ricanconsultoria spells as R-I-C-A-M-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-O-R-I-A and .com.br for Brazil. And we'll put it all in the, in the show notes. But Ricardo, it's been great to have you on the show. I mean, I really did appreciate your insights into a market and a, and a geography, which I have a huge amount of personal and you know professional, very, very positive experience of. One thing, I, I don't miss much about not being in the corporate world anymore, but one of the things I do miss is my, tri- my trips, to, uh, <laughs> trips to Brazil. But maybe that'll change. <laughs> Mark, I can totally relate to what you're saying for two reasons. The first one is that I have also changed my, my, my perspective and I certainly don't miss being in big companies as well. On the other hand, I totally understand what you're talking about Brazil. As, as you mentioned, I, I used to live in the US and Europe and I loved both experiences, but uh, I'm glad to be in Brazil. It's, it's a great place to be despite all uh, the challenges that I mentioned before. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your time, Ricardo, and um, look forward to meeting you one of these days in person. But thanks very much. I'm sure our audience will have enjoyed it as much as I have. So at my, I'm looking forward to that. And, and, and maybe the last point of contact that if someone wants to get to contact me by email, my email is ricardo, or I-C-A-R-D-O, at ricanconsultoria.com.br. Brilliant. We'll put that in show notes. Many thanks for your time, Ricardo. My pleasure. So it's Mark again. I hope you found our exploration of one of the world's most fascinating countries of interest. And as you know, I've got a background in the agribusiness, and and I still never fail to be astonished by the fact that there is such enormous potential for agriculture, not just in Brazil, but also in other parts of the continent. And that alone is going to be an enormous source of growth for the country, even before some of the other opportunities that we discussed on this interview are realised. I mean, it is hard to argue with Ricardo's analysis 
that the country will only continue its rise up the list of global economies. The question, I guess, is when that's going to happen. Now, as in other interviews, we explore the importance of culture to creating and sustaining an organization's innovation ecosystem. Ricardo was pretty blunt about the fact that that Brazil's history of short-term thinking in business, which has been a function in many respects of hyperinflations in the past, can act as a barrier to the long-term innovation that he sees as being critical to the future success of the country. And it was interesting to hear of the work taking place to create more of an owner's mindset in companies as one approach to tackling this. And the at-time volatile environment of Brazil has fostered an agility within business and is essentially an accelerator to innovation. And I think back to my time at Syngenta when we developed a bartering program to deal with the, uh, the currency volatility and the credit crunch. And that became a source of, adv- of competitive advantage for us as we rolled that program out across many, many crops well ahead of the competition. So again, a great example of how some of the specific systemic challenges that the country faced can actually be turned around if you're able to look at them from a different perspective. Now, I also enjoyed the opportunity to get Ricardo's take on 3G. This is the company I've talked about several times in the past, you know, a very visible Brazilian export of the last 20 years or so. And to hear Ricardo share his views of previous guests on the transformative impact that the likes of AI and blockchain and driverless cars can be expected to have in Brazil as they will have elsewhere around the world. So a lot to think about, a different perspective from Brazil, which complements a previous perspective from Africa and another one from India. Again, as always, we're very keen to give you access to these different perspectives and welcome any feedback, any comments you've got to this interview, as well as to the others in our library of of well over 70 now that we have put together over the last couple of years. So this is Mark Bidwell, Changing Perspectives, one podcast at a time. (laughs) 